2013, a man awoke at 2.30 a.m. to see the silhouette of a huge animal on his tent. Before he knew it, he was in the jaws of a polar bear who was galloping down the beach with his head in his mouth. He was quickly running away from the safety of the camp and towards the sea. The man could smell the putrid stench of rotten fish coming from the bear's mouth. In the darkness, the bear took him further and further away from the camp and the people who might have a chance to save him. This is the story of Matt Dyer. Matt Dyer was a 48-year-old attorney who worked at Pine Tree Legal Assistance in Lewiston, Maine. Matt enjoyed nature and he liked to garden, hike, walk his dogs. He just really loved getting out in nature. In the fall of 2012, Matt had decided he wanted to do a pretty big trip. He wanted an adventure. He saw an ad in the latest issue of the Sierra Club magazine. It stood out to him and it seemed like an adventure of a lifetime. It was two weeks of trekking through Canada's northern Labrador coast with the possibility of seeing the world's largest land carnivore, the polar bear. The ad warned that participants must be fit and experienced hikers and they'd have to accept an element of risk, including being stuck in the middle of nowhere, an area that's super remote and there's very little access to emergency medical care. There'd be two leaders on this trip, Rich Gross, who was 59 and had led trips in remote parts around the world since 1990, and Marta Chase. She was 58 and had been leading trips since she was in high school. And together, her and Rich had guided about 14 trips together. Rich had the initial idea to head to Torngat Mountains National Park in 2013. At the time, it was one of Canada's newest national parks. Rich was drawn to the spiritual appeal of the mountains and the areas just seemed magical to him. The sharp, jagged mountains leading down the long fjords that cut over land. It was an area that only a few hundred people saw each year. He was drawn to the feeling of being small in a vast wilderness, not unlike the wilderness you see behind me. In case you're wondering, I'm in the Yukon Territory and this is a very similar area to where this story took place. It's tundra, there's low shrubs, there's jagged peaks behind me. So Rich had always tried to find remote places that not many people had seen before for his tours. And Marta, although she wanted to see the park, she was a little bit leery about hiking in polar bear country, and I don't blame her. Who wouldn't be? <laughs> My philosophy is never to go anywhere near polar bears. Torngat National Park is located in Canada's Newfoundland in Labrador and was established as Canada's 42nd National Park in 2008. It comes from the Inuktitut word Tongate, meaning place of the spirits. The park is on the Labrador Peninsula in northern Newfoundland and about 500 miles south of the Arctic Circle. All visitors to the park must obtain park use permits, register with Parks Canada, and undergo an orientation before setting off on independent treks or boat trips in the park. The ranges of the Torngat Mountains are separated by deep fjords and finger lakes surrounded by sheer rock walls. These fjords are produced by glaciation as glaciers carve their way through the landscape. Icebergs can be seen dotting the water as polar bears, caribou, and whales migrate through the area. This area is also the traditional homeland of the Inuit of Labrador and Nunavik. Now let's talk a little bit about polar bears. You know that cute, cuddly, white little floofy bear who you see in the zoo or on TV? Well, the looks can be deceiving because these guys are the Arctic's number one predator. The exact number of polar bears along the coast is unknown, but may number in the hundreds according to the government of Newfoundland. Large males can weigh up to 1,700 pounds and stand up to 10 feet tall. What I find fascinating about them is that they're more adapted to the sea than to land. In fact, they're so adapted to the sea that they're considered a marine mammal and they can swim constantly for days. So if you're trying to outswim a polar bear, you're screwed. They're absolutely top of the food chain and feed primarily on ringed and bearded seals. Parks Canada runs the Torngat Mountains base camp and research station. The camp sits just outside the southern limit of the park on Saglak Fjord. After sending an email to Parks Canada and getting no response, Marta was put in touch with the operator of two adventure camps, Elaine Lagasse. He'd been arranging trips into the Torngats for decades and knew the area very well. Together, Marta and Elaine created the trip plan for the group. The group of seven hikers met in Montreal and then they flew to a small town called Kujuac in northern Quebec. It's the largest Inuit community in Nunavik, the Inuit region of Quebec. 
Then from there, they take a small charter plane to Elaine's camp and spend the night there. The next morning, a float plane would drop the group in the Torngats, where they would be on their own for 11 days. As I mentioned earlier, Marta always had a concern for the polar bears, and it was always in her thoughts. She had experience with black bears and grizzlies, but not polar bears. It was a whole new challenge for them to be prepared for. As far as safety precautions go, Parks Canada strongly recommends visitors hire a bear guard, but it's not mandatory. These guards are armed and they go through rigorous training to keep visitors safe. Parks Canada also makes it mandatory that people view polar bear safety information and a DVD that they provide, which is kind of funny. The park reviews gear, clothing lists, as well as food cache systems. Visitors must also provide the park with a detailed trip plan and safety plan, including a polar bear encounter plan. So Parks Canada agreed to send the polar bear safety DVD to Elaine's camp so that the group could watch it before they entered the park, because it's mandatory, right? And the park also told Marta that they were in really good hands with Elaine as he's very experienced in the area. They discussed their safety protections with Parks Canada. They were carrying flare guns. They had an electric fence for their tents and they had an electric fence for their cooking area. They also had bear bangers. And in case you're wondering what a bear banger is, this is a bear banger. So it's a pen-like thing, pen-like implement that might be frozen now. Oh no, there we go. So you pull this thing down, discharges. This goes in here, the banger and then you let it go, it smacks the back of that and it explodes out and it makes, they make a variety of noises, screamers, like they sound like fireworks and it's very scary and I've scared off a few bears on my day with these. They're also carrying bear spray, which I also have with me because I am in grizzly bear country. Parks Canada told them that all these precautions were fine. In fact, they don't even require that groups have electric fencing. So Rich and his group thought they were being extra safe with this added precaution. The group headed out for dinner that night and went to watch their Parks Canada DVD on bear safety. Now here's where there are different accounts of the story. Everyone in the group of hikers said that Elaine told them the DVD hadn't arrived from Parks Canada. So Parks Canada asked him to talk to them about polar bear safety instead. Elaine disputes that and he says that he showed them the DVD. So I'm not really sure who's telling the truth here. So as they ate, Elaine shared stories of his run-ins with polar bears and what he learned over the years guiding people in polar bear country. He emphasized that they should be aware and prepared at all times. Polar bears aren't like grizzlies, they're hunters. They're always looking for meat. Because bears traveled along the water, he suggested the group camp away from the edge of the fjord. If they did that and slept with the electric fence around them, they should be fine, he told them. <laughs> On Sunday, July 1st, after a jaw-dropping flight over giant peaks and glassy lakes, a float plane dropped the group off at Natchvac Fjord. Marta and Rich scouted for a place to camp and they found a place and set up for their first night. Elaine had told them to find a high place to sleep because this fjord was a place where polar bears had been seen before. The first thing the group did was of course set up those electric fences. They switched on the fences and watched the lights come to life and it seemed that the fences were working. A bit of excitement came their way shortly after when they saw their first wildlife sighting. A wolf was walking down by the water. The group was super excited. The sky then darkened and the group went to bed at about 10.30 p.m. At about 4 a.m., one of the group members got up to pee and instantly saw a mother polar bear and her cub walking along the shore. The mother was sniffing the air and the group grabbed their cameras and started taking pictures excitedly. Matt was actually on the verge of tears as he watched the bears in their natural habitat. They were just walking along the shore peacefully. Rich described it as magnificent as he saw the pair dive into the water and then swim off. On Monday, July 22nd, the group headed out to explore the area around the fjord. When they finished the hike, they had to cross a little stream to get back to camp. And as they were taking off their boots to go across the stream, Matt looked up and noticed a great big polar bear staring at them. They did what you're supposed to do when you see a bear. You gather together, make noise, shout, make yourselves look big so the bear gets intimidated. The bear started walking towards them, nose in the air and tongue sticking out. Despite the group's efforts in doing everything they were told to do, the bear showed zero fear of them and kept coming closer. He continued walking towards them when Rich fired off the flare gun, and even then it didn't stop until the flare landed right in front of the bear. And then it took off running. They reached the safety of their campsite and it started raining hard, but they could still see the bear hanging out and watching them. Most of the group settled into their tents for a bit, have a little bit of relaxation for before dinner, 
but Matt was a little bit uneasy. He stood watching the bear for more than an hour. One of the other group members noticed this and said it was like Maggot was standing guard. Matt later said that he stood there for a long time because the bear's presence made him pretty nervous. At about 5 p.m., they all made their way to the cooking area. The bear was still on that ledge. They watched it rolling on its back, resting its head on the grass, and crossing its forelegs, and just watching them. One of the group members said they felt reassured by the bear interactions they'd had that day. They did what they were supposed to do, and the bears acted accordingly. But Matt was still uneasy. He asked Rich about someone standing watch for the night. They could take two-hour shifts until the bear left. But Rich wasn't worried. He said that that's what the fence was for. On Tuesday, July 23rd, one of the group got up a few times to go to the bathroom and the bear was there until about 1 a.m. when he finally noticed it was gone. The rain turned to sleet and foul weather had descended upon the group. The next morning was cold and rainy. Later, which ensured the fence was turned on and all of the hikers crawled into their tents. At about 2.30 a.m., Matt says something woke him up. He was sleeping on his back and looked up to see a shadow come over the top of his tent. That shadow turned out to be two huge bear legs. He knew exactly what it was, so he started to scream and just then the bear came down on top of the tent. Bam! Matt described the, it as pawing at him, just pawing and pawing. Marta sat up quickly in her tent, which was beside Matt's, and saw the bear over Matt's tent. It was down on all fours, eye level with her, and it was huge. It was all white except for the black of its eyes and its nose. It turned and stared right at her. Staring back, she screamed out for Rich and grabbed her flare gun. Rich awoke to Matt screaming and Marta screaming Rich's name. He jumped out of the tent. The tent was then lifted off the ground with Matt in it. The bear was trying to get its mouth on Matt's head. And Matt was covering his head with his hands. But then the bear clamped down on his head, kind of on the side of his head and jaw, and ripped him out of the tent. It was described later, it was just like a champagne cork coming out of a bottle. The bear then stood up. Everyone could hear Matt screaming and hollering. The bear went running off down the beach, dragging Matt by his head. Matt vividly recalls the smell of the bear's breath. It was a fishy, oily, gross smell. Matt said a voice came to him and said, you know you're going to die. He could feel the bones cracking in his neck and his skull and he thought at any moment he was going to be dead. Matt recalls his face bumping into the bear's chest as it ran. He stared at its white stomach and saw yellow stains on its back end as it carried him away from the safety of camp. The shouting of his friends actually caught the bear's attention and it turned its head towards the sounds, flipped Matt into the air and slammed him onto the ground as it kept running. It was running towards the water, its safe haven. Matt heard the sound of the gun go off and saw the flare go over him and then a second explosion happened right in front of him and the bear. The bear dropped him and took off running. But then moments later, it started to come back to Matt because it was not gonna give up that prey very easily. Matt was trying to get up, but he couldn't. He was just too injured. Then he heard the bear coming back. Its massive paws were scuffling along the beach. The scuffling grew louder and louder and the bear was coming back for him. Matt could hear the group screaming and screaming and just then Rich shot off another flare. Matt remembers saying, don't come back bear, don't come back. And luckily the bear took off running away from them after the second shot. So they knew they had to get to Matt fast as he wasn't moving. So two of the group ran over, not knowing if he was alive or dead. And they soon realized that he was still alive. He was a bloody mess and pretty dazed, but alive. Now imagine this, a member of your group was just attacked by a freaking polar bear and you're running in the dark to bring him back to campsite. You don't know where the bear is. It's rainy, it's snowy, it's miserable out, it's dark, and you have to get this injured person away from a polar bear. One person in the group was a physician and assessed Matt. They only had five shells left in the flare gun. It was dark and if the bear returned and was persistent, they knew they were gonna be in trouble. So they moved Matt to the tent area with the cook's shelter and the physician tended to him there. Matt thanked everybody over and over in a raspy voice. His crushed jaw made speaking difficult. The biggest wound was a gash on his neck. The doctor could see Matt's carotid artery. It was still intact, but if anything caused it to tear, he'd bleed to death immediately. So the doctor was pretty worried. Matt was in critical condition and they were hundreds of miles from help. So they finally got a hold of the RCMP, uh, Parks Canada and the Torngat Mountains Base Camp. All three had helicopters, but they had trouble getting a hold of people that could actually get a helicopter off the ground. 
On top of this, the fog started rolling in and until that cleared, there was really no way rescue could come. They set up two people watching for the bear, each equipped with a flare gun, and at around 4.30 a.m. they learned Matt was finally in stable condition and the group just felt a huge wave of relief. If his carotid artery didn't rupture and he kept breathing, well, then he'd survive. The helicopter finally arrived around 8.30 a.m. with a bear guard that had a rifle and a medic to help Matt. At this point, Matt was still conscious and the medic gave him some painkillers. The medic said that Matt kept wanting to stand up and didn't want to sit down as his back was sore. And the medic joked that that's not bad for someone who just got attacked by a polar bear. At least you're around to feel something. Matt had an injury to his throat and the blood had gone into his lungs. As the medic took off the bandages, the first thing he noticed was the smell. Matt had it swallowed or inhaled at least a half a liter of blood and it was going rancid inside of his lungs. The medic said it smelled like death. The Parks Canada Bear Guard who flew in with the helicopter stayed with the group and had his gun slung over his shoulder the whole time. He then told the group what he saw before the helicopter landed. There was a large polar bear walking in the area where the group had planned to hike that day. So after Matt was gone, a speedboat was trying to get to the rest of the group. And then they were going to send a helicopter, but the weather was too poor. They ended up waiting about 12 more long, agonizing hours, and a fishing boat finally arrives. <music> hours later, and 16 long hours after the attack, Matt was placed in a medically induced coma and was then medevac to Montreal. He had two broken vertebrae in his spine, but they were high in his neck, and the doctors weren't too concerned about paralysis. His jaw, his hand were broken, his lung collapsed. He had dozens of puncture wounds, including that gaping hole in his neck. Some of the wounds on his skull became infected. A tendon in his arm was punctured. His larynx was broken, and that left him unable to speak for several weeks. Long story short, he was a mess. But not long after his arrival, he awoke to see his wife of 25 years staring back at him. So I'm really curious as to how this group was allowed to go into the park without a bear guard, so I kind of looked further into it. And Parks Canada has said that visitors regularly encounter polar bears in the park, but there's never been an attack like this since the park was established. There's a documentary by Vice on Matt's story. In it, a Parks Canada employee says that the attack occurred in an area where we would have and did highly recommend that the group not be traveling in or camping in. Another Parks Canada employee said you would never have seen a bear guard agreeing to camp there, that they recommend people at least be 10 kilometers inland, and even then you need to be careful. She says right where they camped is a polar bear highway and that they see bears there all the time. However, when Vice asked the hiking group if this is what they were told, they have a much different story. Marta said that in all the time she spent with Parks Canada, they were never told that their camping spot was a known highway for the polar bears. She says that they told Parks Canada exactly where they would be camping and no one told them of the dangers of that particular spot. She says that specific spot was actually advertised heavily as a place to camp and that they didn't come up with the spot on their own. When Vice questioned Parks Canada again, they asked, well, why was Matt's group allowed to camp there? And his reply was that Matt's group came in along before we fully understood the potential risks that were associated with that area. Well, he adds that they, they can give groups as much good advice as they can, and people still want to go in and out of the park and can kind of go where they want. Sometimes they take chances, sometimes they win, and sometimes they don't. An interview that Backpacker.com did with Tom Smith, a bear biologist specializing in human-bear interaction, he said that bears are curious animals. When we put camps in their habitat, we actually create an attractive nuisance. That creates a visual, auditory, and sometimes olfactory experience for them. They're seeing new things that are new to them, and they become curious, so they just might approach a camp. As for the electric fence, Smith has used many of these fences and had great success with them, even with the largest of bears. He did say that if there had been a bear guard, the incident wouldn't have happened because he would have scared it off and there probably would have been guarding throughout the night. So Parks Canada conducted an investigation of the incident and a number of new safety practices were implemented, though I can't find exactly what they are. Their website still says you don't need to hire a bear guard. But regardless, Sierra Club trips no longer travel in polar bear country. Matt did physical therapy for his neck and saw a specialist to help repair his damaged vocal cords. He still speaks in a raspy voice due to the injury. As time passed though, he now says he has come out of the attack feeling emotionally strong and emotionally grateful for the many people who saved his life. He says it changed him in that he got the anxiety of life knocked out of him. He's not holding anything back now, but he's also never going to go camping in polar bear country 
again. And Matt actually visited the park at the site of the attack again with the Vice documentary, um, but slept offshore on a boat with armed bear guards. As for the bear and how Matt feels about it, well, this hilarious quote sends me into orbit. I often think that the bear has had much malice towards me as I do towards a pork chop. He goes on to say that they're in a stressed out environment up there now, and if anything, I feel empathy towards these creatures. So that's the incredible story of Matt's survival. I hope you enjoyed it. So let me know if you ever plan on camping in polar bear country, and if so, will you get an armed bear guard? Will you use an electric fence? Will you take some bear spray and keep it on your hip? I sure will. Actually, no, I'm never going camping in polar bear country. Anyways, thanks for watching. This morning I'm so clear a lot as any